Welcome, everybody. So the panel discussion that um, was, Maria, still hear me? Is that fine? Yeah, oh, it's on. That's better. Um, welcome to the panel discussion that was uh, created by uh, Jonah Brasovic. Uh, Jonah is a um, staff member here at the university. He is in educational technology, and he will talk with his team about. Let me briefly look at my paper here, uh, the pedagogic pedagogical freedom of the Debian software. And uh, I think you are going to introduce your own panel members, isn't that right? Absolutely. Okay. Oh, this is really loud. <laughs> okay, uh, applause for the Hello. panel, please. <laughs> uh, thanks so much for coming out on a, on a Sunday to support free software. Um, I want to first introduce the panel. and. Uh, we have a, a great panel that's composed of a lot of different folks. Uh, Matt Karinga is a software developer who recently defended his PhD dissertation uh, just last week. And the title of the dissertation was Social Software and the Struggle for Freedom. He'll be starting as an assistant professor at Adelphi University, um, leading up a brand new program in educational technology. So that's great. Um, Alicia Selly is a faculty librarian at Brooklyn College, which is part of the city of New York. Uh, City University of New York, and um, she's doing a lot of really interesting education and work uh, around teaching uh, students how to think about and, and use technology and open access and media literacy. Uh, Mallory Nodal is a public school, has a great deal of experience as a public school teacher and is an organizer in technology who's been organizing for over a decade. Uh, she works right now with, she's a member of the May 1st People Link um, Collective. What's the best way to describe it? It's a membership organization that provides a lot of technology services and organizations to NGOs and, and activist organizations. And uh, they're all Debian shop there. Um, finally, we have Shamim from uh, the Fadina. Uh, well, it's from the For Faradian Technologies, and they are a uh, provider of the open source Fadina software, which is uh, software that's being used currently to administer and manage schools throughout the world uh, internationally. And they're working really hard on um, moving directly into supporting more teaching and learning activities. So, so that is our panel. Um, I wanted to start things off by just giving you guys a, a, an understanding of, of my, my take on the motivation for, for, for what we're talking about. Um, I think right now in the educational world, it's still the case that a lot of people regard technology as the plumbing, uh, the stuff that kind of uh, is unseen and, 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 and makes things tick but uh, isn't particularly visible. Uh, I think nowadays um, it's really the case that software architecture has started to resemble traditional architecture as a as more of a leading art. And uh, so, for example, if there was a building on campus that was being frequented by 80% of the student population three times a day, a lot of people would would care a lot about what was you know how that building was designed and what was going on there. Um, I found in my experience that educational technology is a really compelling and provocative example of the importance of freedom. Um, and if you uh, you know, follow along with the, the architectural um, idea there or metaphor, it's, uh, uh, it's really easy to see ways in which uh, the ways in, ways in which people teach um, are, are now being mediated by the software that, they, that they're using. So whether or not you want your students to raise their hand before they speak or, you know, speak at a turn like in a seminar or whether or not you're setting the chairs up in a circle or, or in rows um, has direct corollaries in the software that you're using to teach. And the importance of you know, at least institutions, if not departments or professors and, and teachers themselves, to have control over their teaching style seems more and more paramount and is a, a really vivid example for the importance of having control over the, the kind of software that you're, you're using to teach. And um, um, beyond that, I think we really wanted to, to stress and you know, the composition of this panel is meant to represent ways in which what's going on in the educational world um, really cuts across sectors. So what we're trying to do today is, is talk a lot about ways in which technology is being used to teach not only technology that's being used in the educational sectors. So to the extent that um, many of the ways in which we're using technology is medi mediating communications between humans and humans nowadays, not just humans and machines, many of these systems exist to or attempt to balance the flows of knowledge, communication, and power. Um, and I think that's a problem, I think especially a lot of people in this room would, would recognize in the abstract that exists um, between not only teachers and their students, but also government and their citizens, uh, nonprofits, and and their constituents, and and honestly, even um, corporations and their viral customers, no, the viral campaigns with their customers. I mean, there's there's certain ways in which um, 
uh, these features cut across uh, a lot of these different sectors that are non-obvious. So um, I'm definitely interested in ways in which uh, we can make what's going on in the educational world more interesting and relevant to what's going on in other sectors and, and vice versa. There's certainly a problem in academia where people continue to regard their problems as singularly unique and you know isolate themselves from a lot of what's going on in the rest of, of the free software movement. Um, so I think you know with that in mind I, I want to uh, I want to kick things off and uh, and Matt's going to start talking about you know some of his work in this area and then we're going to go around just a second on the structure here we're going to do really quick introductions and then um, I'm going to um, you know seed a couple of questions for the panelists and we really want to try to run this more as a conversation. Um, uh, very quickly, just kind of show of hands, how many people here currently work in the educational sector? Okay, so there's a lot of people that have this background experience. And, you know, how many people came here to learn more about what's going on with software in this area? All right, so quite a mix. Um, there you go. So, Matt, take it away. Is this on? There we go. All right. Uh, so when I was invited to talk in this panel, I looked up pedagogical freedom on Google to see what it meant, and this panel was the first hit. <laughs> so I feel lucky that I'm going first because I get to define it. And there's a, freedom in education is nothing new. I think just the term it was, is a little bit newer. But uh, freedom in free software and software freedom means different things to different people. People, and there are different values that people emphasize in it. And when you talk about freedom in education, the same thing happens. Uh, what it means and what freedom we're looking for is different, and there are different values that are highlighted uh, in different aspects of it. And I want to talk about one idea of freedom in education that I think is particularly relevant today and motivates the way I think about educational technology and educational software and tools. So I'm going to start with um, an idea from a French political philosopher Jacques Rancière, he's currently writing, and this is from 1990, he said, one doesn't owe people what they can take for themselves, and education is like liberty. It isn't given, it's taken. So as I'm working on my degree and working w in schools and working with the internet and seeing things change over the last 10 years, I'm starting to think about like where we are and the importance of thinking about education and learning beyond schools and not instead of schools per se, but what is the role of the school and what is the role of the tools that we use there? And for a free education, it's about people being empowered to learn for themselves and not receiving a packaged program or a packaged curriculum. And I think we have the ability to, to use uh, technology to help forward this goal. Technology is not gonna do it but on its own, but if we think about it in certain ways it can. And I'm going to refer to uh, Ivan Illich, who wrote uh, Deschooling Society in 1971, where he kind of attacked the idea of schools um, as instilling this consumerist mentality where, well, I'll just read what he says. He says, many self-styled revolutionaries are victims of school. They see even liberation as a product of an institutional process. Only liberating oneself from school will dispel such illusions. Discovery that most learning requires no teaching can be neither manipulated nor planned. Each one of us is personally responsible for his or her own de-schooling, and only we have the power to do it. This is a very de demotivating thing while I'm working on my PhD <laughs> in education, uh, but also helpful in terms of thinking about software. Uh, so what Ill says is what we should start with not the question of what someone should learn but what kinds of things and people might learners want to be in contact with in order to learn? And I think that there are parallels in that thought with uh, the open education resource movement, for example. Uh, and what they say, this is from the Cape Town Declaration 2001, it is built on the belief that everyone should have the freedom to use, customize, improve, and redistribute educational resources without constraint. And this idea obviously comes from free software. Uh, and, but the power in it is that what we should develop are things that people can use and adapt to their own purposes. We shouldn't try to come up with one solution, one monolithic way of teaching or education. And the types of educational technology that I like the best are restrained and focus on letting what people can do 
for themselves to let them do by themselves and what technology can augment to let it do it. So I'm always hesitant when I see like a total integrated learning system that's going to teach you everything from beginning to end and do assessment and, and uh, track you from kindergarten through, you know, 16. Uh, but I think that what we can learn as educators from free software generally is that free software thrives and the freedom in free th software thrives in open protocols, <clears throat> in open formats, and that collaborating on those and thinking what are the protocols for open education, what are the formats we need for people to teach themselves, that's the lesson that educators can take and all work with uh, people in free software to, to really get that out there. And um, that's all I'm going to say for now, but we're going to have time for, for questions later. Um, so I have a little bit of a different take on this because um, I'm approaching this from the library. So I think of education maybe more sometimes as a space that students come into. Um, but I wanted to ask the audience, um, what do you all think that librarians do? So tell me. Yeah, just shout it out. I just want to... Oh, okay, catalog. Hand out books. Run teaching and learning software at universities. Yeah. Worry what the patrons are using the computers for. <laughs> Worry what the patrons are using the computers for. Okay. Collect history. Help conduct research. Okay, and, and what what sort of um, I guess higher goals do you think that librarians think about when they're when they're doing these things? Archive. Archive. Right, that's a digital archive. It's a digital archive. Okay. What was that? I'm sorry. Okay, so preserving information for the long haul. Okay, make information accessible. Um, Worry about budgets. <laughs> Worry about budgets. Um, so tell us the solution. Okay, so tell us what is the real thing. Did we, did we get it right? <laughs> well, what I would ask you is how are the goals of librarianship and what, how are the, the things that librarians do different from what perhaps software developers do? Or how are they similar? So for all of those things that we just mentioned, are you all also working for free access to information, which I think is one of the main tenets of librarianship? Um, are you working to make sure that uh, knowledge is preserved uh, over time? Um, I think there are many, many alliances that librarians have with uh, free software developers and um, people who are, who are interested in free education as well. Um, so what I see happening in my field right now is that many librarians are interested in open access and there's a lot of interest in uh, making our own publications that we are we are creating open um, so that they're not uh, they're not going to be uh, reliant on proprietary systems of whatever kind in order to read the work that we're developing and we're also really interested um, in, in open access just overall and free culture um, more and more, which I think is very exciting. But I also think that while these developments are really great and wonderful, um, we're not thinking so much about how we can implement free software. Um, and I personally, when I teach, usually have 50 minutes. So I'm in an academic setting, I'm at Brooklyn College, and I have 50 minutes in which students are brought into my library and I am supposed to make the information literate which for me is a lifelong goal. It's very, very difficult to squeeze into those 50 minutes. Um, and what I feel like I'm able to do is to make them start to question software, to make them start to question information systems that they use already, such as Google. Um, so I get them thinking about why a hit shows up as the very first in terms of relevance on a Google page. Like why they don't know why that happens or why it's a secret from them that that happens. Um, but I don't know how to, how to get them from, from beginning to question these systems in that 50 minutes to then understanding some of the alternatives. So that's where I think I want help from all of you today and beyond this session. Um, and I also think that I'm very interested in how librarians and techies are educators and how we can work together to form alliances to, to further understand where, where we both need more help. I think that um, librarians often
often are the people who might be teaching students or people outside of the educational realm um, how to use technology. Um, but we, uh, we, we need more help being advocates for, for freer, freer systems, so. We're gonna go over to Mallory, whose uh, work is more involved with advocacy and activism, which I think in many ways is a, is a form of teaching too. Yeah. Um, I actually have two distinct perspectives. One is, um, and I'll just go chronologically, um, I was a public high school teacher for a few years, um, and not specifically related to technology, teaching technology, but I was teaching science. Um, but I just, in learning about the systems, um, specifically in New York City, but I think it applies everywhere based on um, just questions I've asked and answers I've gotten from other teachers in other places that, um, and also in other people that work for the for public systems everywhere, that they're, uh, the biggest barrier I think to implementing sensible collaborative software um, is a policy level. Isn't it um, where governments spend their money based on contracts they make and that is something that we can influence, um, but it takes a lot of advocacy, it, a really kind of icky, icky level. <laughs> you have to um, start asking um, governments to stop making 15-year contracts with Microsoft, that sort of thing. Until then, we'll, the, all of our public, um, st all of our students that are educated in public schools, um, all of our professionals that work um, in the public sector are going to be well-versed in Microsoft um, products, Microsoft software. Um, um, and, but I think that um, what I saw is that the high school teachers that I were working with that were really trying to reach their students and um, uh, bring literacy into the classroom often were using online collaborative tools more and more. Um, they were using Google Docs, they were using Twitter, um, there were even um, teachers that were um, rogue and they would go and get YouTube videos downloaded and then show them in their classrooms because YouTube is blocked by, well anyway, the New York, um, I don't know what else there, but there's a filter on those sorts of sites. But anyway, so, so teachers and, and educators are definitely seeing the use of collaborative online tools. Um, so there is some possibility of um, getting, getting things changed. If not, just making the filters less <laughs> severe. Um, and then my other perspective um, is as an activist organizer. So um, I've been advocating, you know, as an advocate for free software use um, in social movements, um, um, really around the world in, in lots of different settings. Um, I think that it's easy, that there are many arguments that have to be made for using free software in social movements. And one of the easier approaches would be to talk about anti-capitalism. So non-corporate use and freedom. Obviously free speech and, and freedom, it's not something that's such a stretch, right? Um, but I think also then kind of what this panel is trying to get at is why should we be using it um, in terms of its, its power to educate and to, to collaborate? Um, and I think that in those ways, the, the two distinct perspectives I have can be related together, that it's truly the, the um, what, what is so important about um, free software and um, is the ability to collaborate with people that are um, sort of building it, making it better, but also folks that are using it in sort of educational level. Um, so I could, um, oh, the other thing I wanted to say is you reminded me of the title of this panel is the same title of a book, right, by Paula Freire. No? No. What is that one? Pedagogy of the Quest. No, 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 but I, well, anyway, nonetheless. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. Pedagogy of Freedom. Okay, anyway, so there's a, there's a long history of sort of this idea of freedom and um, radical education and advocacy, so it fits in really well. And I was, I was also going to mention then that uh, Paulo Freire Institute in um, Brazil uh, has started a World Education Forum um, many years back. It's part of the World Social Forum movement. And this year, in, in October, it's going to be held in Palestine. Um, and for various reasons, it's going to be polycentric, um, mostly ter in terms of physical access to the spaces. Um, for as many people as possible. And, there's, and, and so because it is polycentric in about five different locations, they're gonna be using um, technology in a way that's never been, I, I don't think, been used before. Um, they're gonna be doing a lot of internet streaming and, and some other things. So um, at that level anyway, I mean, I, I know it's been used before, but um, at such a overt level. So I just wanted to mention that um, as uh, something that if people had questions about, um, and which is also, I, I guess, if, I, if there's time later, I can talk about the experience that 
we had with the U.S. Social Forum, that there are a few people in the room that were there um, working on this in a very collaborative way, and there um, are some interesting stories about how we were able to integrate sort of educating um, movement activists um, using some of the free software that we, we, we built together. Shamim's uh, going to tell us a bit more about the Fedina software and um, some of the work he's been doing around that. Yeah, sure, John. Thank you. Um, the panel has given good points like, regarding the educational system, so that's great. Um, actually, I'll be talking about more on um, a software. Actually, it's a system which can actually um, do the school management uh, online. So basically, um, it, the product name is called Fedina. It's, it's an open source school management system. And it helps like all the teaching. It actually solves the, all these teaching and school-related activities online. So you can, I mean, it's accessible 24 by 7. Basically, uh, I'll just quickly touch upon the history of how the project Fedina was developed. Like um, few years back, when um, the, actually the software was developed by a company called Faradian Technologies, and before starting the project, like we wanted to see if there was a solution or a one-time solution which, which actually solves all the modules which we need for the school management. So, which was actually an open source. Uh, so, there was no at that time which actually has all the modules or all the solutions that can solve for the school management. So, uh, keeping that in mind, the enthusiastic developers in Faradian, like they uh, came up with a solution which actually can help the world uh, in, in contributing the educational system because uh, it's it's available as open source, and we would like all the um, enthusiasts here actually to see the software for themselves. So I'll just give you um, a back um, background, like um, what is what it includes and how does it help the uh, educational system. So the last version, the first version actually was uh, released last year, Fedina 1.0, and basically the main main goal was to see the software will be accessible by everyone because the um, for, uh, for providing a solution which is like um, uh, so that all can use it like it's the user friendliness that's what more important because we don't need to have a software which is complex and have training course involved in that and so that is one of the main features which we have built in Fedina so it's really eye catchy the designs are eye catchy like uh, basically like anyone with a basic knowledge in computer can actually work on the software so that's one of the main benefits and uh, to the, I mean, the advantages of Fedina or the modules present in Fedina, like it's basically all the modules which you need for a school management for a high level. So basically, it has the student admission, student attendance. Then you have the timetable, you have the examination, you have the, I mean, you have the features like, like resource finance. So you have the system where you can actually have a school running using that software. So um, apart from that, you have a reporting module which for each of the modules which are desc described above has like um, you can create reports from that you can actually customize the reports you can actually filters to create reports online and the data is available 24 by 7 so you can actually use it anytime basically if you see that the advantages are like the teachers i mean the productivity will be much more increasing because they can actually track their students their progress their attendance their marks and also apart from that like we have uh, messaging alerts from the software itself where you can I mean send alerts you can send emails so basically it, um, it helps in all the teaching related issues online itself and we are actually focusing on e-learning because that is going to be the vibe now like uh, e-learning e school and e infrastructure so that that's going to be coming in the next version of Fedina where actually um, all the teachers worldwide can actually collaborate their uh, information using the software so um, coming to advan I mean the users like um, currently uh, it's being used in like Africa and India most of uh, most of the schools in Africa and India has already implemented the software and they actually understood the potential how much it can help the educational system because some of the softwares are not readily available like it it involves much cost training and it's not affordable by some schools so for those like uh, Fedina is really a helpful thing like they have understood the potential uh, potential of the software and they implemented in their system. So now, uh, in the next version, which I was talking about, was the e-learning. And if that comes into place, those schools, those remote schools, actually can greatly benefit from the software because 
teachers from other worldwide can actually use that system and provide uh, help to the other schools worldwide. So that is one of the greatest, um, I mean, the module which we'll be putting it in Fedina. So um, there are other advantages too, uh, like um, if you see the alerts, that's helpful for like uh, the students as well as the parents to have a look into their marks or there are some modules which are really helpful. So all these are based upon uh, the easy navigation, like uh, you don't need, uh, as I was mentioning before, like you don't need a trained or trained professional or school authorities do not need to hire some professional, authority, I mean like a computer professional would need to work on the software or to understand the system. So it ha and basically it has all the modules to run a school. So, and the other modules which will be modding, uh, adding to the Fedina software is going to help in the future like um, we are going to add one is the in, in infrastructure the e-learning and then we are going now it's like for the schools and we are going to actually expand it to the campus as well as universities and basically one of them Alicia was talking about the library management like um, we are going to input that too in the software so that's going to be a good thing fantastic right. and anyone that wants to learn more about Fedina should really stop by and ask uh, yeah. for more info Afterwards as well. Yeah, actually, like uh, one point more. Like, um, I would like all the I mean, educational enthusiasts here to actually go into the uh, project Vedina.org website. Actually, contribute their into I mean, uh, ideas or I mean, because it's an open source, so everyone has to contribute to it to make it better. So I would greatly appreciate that if you go. Thank you. Uh, no, but I would like to have the Debian team like, involved in it and make it a success. So. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much. Um, uh, where I wanted to start things off, and I think we already touched on this uh, in, a, in a few of the introductions, um, is really with the, this question of, of what the educational world can learn from the Debian community and, and what we might be able to offer or teach the Debian community in, in turn. I know in my personal journey, um, I, when I first got involved with, with free software, it really opened my eyes to ways in which communities could self-organize and, and create learning systems that um, really got me intrigued by the, the, the possibilities around educational technology. If we can only, you know, bottle that energy and, and uh, articulate that process, it really seemed seemed very, very promising. So did anyone here have uh, a particular thoughts on, on that question? Matt, I think you started uh, talking about that when you were talking about open education. Just uh, to continue, sorry, to talk about it a little bit, I, um, I am starting this new program in September uh, and it's about educational technology for teachers. They're gonna be in K-12 primarily and one of the questions I have is, what should they know about free software? And you know, what do you want, what do I want teachers to know about free software? What do I want kids that are in K-12 school system, compulsory school system, to know about open source and free software and what it means? And I think that, that we, we in education need to develop some idea of, of what a, a digital liter literacy of free software means and kind of the skills we want to get across. And I, I think that's something that we touched on a little bit, Alicia, in, in the libraries. Like 50 minutes isn't enough time to do it. And once in your life for 50 minutes, you're never gonna get there. So when does it start? How does it start? And I think that in the US, we're uh, behind probably most of the world in this. So. Yes, and I think uh, Hans has talked this morning as a point of departure, you know, this uh, the important idea of you know, free in theory and free in practice and uh, whether or not there's a certain kind of complexity that is a, a barrier to entry as well. Uh, and crucially, uh, and I think Alicia was gonna get to this in terms of open access, um, whether or not there, there are, um, you know, any layers here that make sense where it makes sense to talk a lot more about uh, media literacy and, and ways in which the values percolate through the systems. Uh, maybe pass that over, she can. Yeah, I think one of the things that I do a lot is um, talk about that dichotomy between producers and consumers with students and try to um, let them know that sometimes they're searching for an article that doesn't exist and they may need to be the person who writes that article, but I often don't think about it in terms of software. So that was really good. This morning's talk was really great for me to start thinking about that and um, urging students when they're upset with the way that systems work to do something about it and to make it more of a participatory experience and then more of an emp empowered educational experience. And I think, I think we've all shared and talked about, probably everyone in this room has had the experience of um, the contrast between the ways in which we dream of software being used and the challenges around trying to cultivate that culture of use, right? So whereby 
user students, anyone shows up and starts using software in, in very different ways. Now I, I imagine with trying to work with the organizations at, at May 1st and people link, um, there's a lot of uh, uh, disconnects or challenges or there's a lot of effort that goes into training them on how to use those systems, but there might be cases on a, on a few different fronts. Um, yeah, I think that the more that um, technologists and developers can start working even just in a volunteer capacity with social movements that I think positive things will come about. Um, one major thing that I hope, um, I mean, I think that I've, I've actually learned a lot more about activism and collecting through looking at it through technology, but going the other way, um, I guess like the, the question of diversity and empowerment of certain communities and having voices heard of different different abilities, different approaches needs needs to definitely um, shift within technology development. So um, I think that that only comes about when we begin really working together. I mean, social movements and developers in like a really um, intimate way because it, it's the kind of thing that does take time, you know, to, to sort of build um, bases, build relationships because it is very interpersonal. We're talking about you know, social movements feeling put off by technology because of emotional, like emotional responses. Um, so it's not something that can just be solved easily, other than just, just more time and more more um, overlap between two two kinds of, of organizers. Fantastic. And while you have the mic, I know that at the social forum mm -hmm. there was a tech congress that that convened and came up with uh, um, a lot of principles and values that I that I think apply strongly to the educational community as well. I don't know if any of those spring right. to mind. Absolutely. So, I mean, just to kind of give a brief background, it was the technologists that, that worked a lot on, on the U.S. social forums, these are already um, folks that are that are both in tune to what's happening in social movements and are intimately involved in them enough to, to sort of spend time volunteering for it, um, and also then movement movement folks that have just begun to become empowered by technology and know about it. So there's that strong overlap, and we came up with ten, ten um, um, principles. Um, and uh, sort of in, in what is the relationship between you know technology activists and movement activists and back and forth, right? So it was it was a really good exercise, and, and you're right. I think it does apply to lots of different um, like Excellent. education for sure. And there's ways to learn more about all these things uh, during questions and follow-ups for sure. Uh, before I open this up to the audience, I wanted to give people a chance to to bring up any of the challenges and problems that they've encountered with with either free software or you know constraints that the proprietary software has imposed oppressively perhaps on, on their on their teaching and learning um, where there I, I know for example uh, this morning we talked a lot about um, the importance of free software and the importance of accessibility to the software but ways in which the movement for freedom is being outflanked by a land grab for data uh, Alicia I know that's uh, really important in your work as well I guess um, for me personally I, I think I can see it more on the outside of um, people who, who still need to be convinced. And I think that sometimes, um, even if you're ideo ideologically aligned with the free software movement, it can still be really, really difficult to, um, to convince people to make change in their day-to-day -day habits. Um, I was just at a conference this, this past week uh, of librarians who are interested in teaching and pedagogy, and there were many, many, many iPads. Um, and <laughs> institutionally purchased iPads. Um, and I d I've, I've done a lot of work with um, anti-DRM and eBooks, and it just kind of breaks my heart, but I'm not sure where to start that conversation a lot of the times. So I think um, the techies that I know have been really great in um, constantly reinforcing that another world is possible, um, and being really supportive of even tiny movements towards um, free software. Um, and I think that uh, however we can expand that that like network of support and I guess love for for software instead of condemning people for maybe uneducated decisions would be really great. Um, so I guess that's what that's what I would really like to further from, from the community. Cool. Any other pet peeves or rants that people want to? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, one thing is like as Alicia was mentioning, like it's a good point. Like I mean, all the Educational, I mean, people who are enthusiastic, like, actually should contribute to each other to make it better. So, I would, I mean, really encourage, like, I think we should start something like an, I mean, not just this panel, should not just be in, inside this panel and if you go out, that's it. I mean, we should continue to work on that and have it done more clearly. So, that's what I want. I just want to say, um, I can understand it, but sometimes 
sometimes the, the beauty of free software isn't apparent to everybody. And especially when I'm talking to educators who, who share many of the same values I do, I try to remember um, to approach it from their point of view that there are educational benefits to free software. And that, you know, that I think with movement politics, the same thing. I'm, I'm always kind of shocked when they fire up PowerPoint and when um, just, but it's not their main goal. They don't care that much about software freedom. They care about other things that are equally important. And we need to remember that they have other goals that are important. Same thing with teachers. They have other things they're trying to do that are really important. And so you need to present it, or I need to at least when I talk to them, present free software in terms of their own goals. And I think that they're very receptive to it, uh, even, even faculty members sometimes. It is an uphill battle, <laughs> or a continuous one. Uh, but tiny steps, I like that a lot, and alternative worlds are possible. Um, we weren't positive who was going to be in the audience today, but um, we're totally open to taking this in a lot of different directions. Um, I don't know if people were most interested in learning about particular pieces of software, uh, new frontiers, things that we're learning. Um, great, we've got a bunch of questions. I think we want to get to the mic for the video, but I'll repeat a question if people can't get there. Another There's another one? Oh, great. Excellent. Uh, mine's pretty easy. It's just a follow-up to the gentleman that just spoke, um, just kind of contrasting people that see the beauty of free software uh, versus those who might, uh, or we, we're horrified when we see what they're using um, for whatever reasons. And he said something like, for equivalent reasons. But isn't, if you're gonna posit that the economy isn't their reason, always and everywhere, ease of use? Question. It, sorry, just repeat the very last thing he said. It sounded like the most important. Uh, isn't their question, isn't their point of view always ease of use? Like that's why they're using. Well, ease of use, maybe the question, but I, I think that's a legitimate concern, because their their goal is to maybe to prepare a class or to prepare research and to have to fight with a New York City bureaucracy to get uh, open office installed in their computers is a really big battle for one teacher to take on when they're trying to teach a class. If they are the tech leader for the school. It's more that person's uh, in their purvey to, to handle that. And so, yeah, ease of use is definitely a problem, but I don't think it's just like the UI. There are a lot of issues around it. Uh, does that make sense? Does that answer your question a little bit? All right. uh, we're generally, when we're speaking of ease of use, uh, not limiting ourselves to the, U the UI, but we're saying uh, change of habits. How easy it is for the person to change their habits right. in general? Um, just, I, I've worked. I guess we've both worked in the New York City public school system, and I cringe any time I boot up a computer there because you can't install anything, you can't access anything, and it won't work <laughs> at the time. But. Yeah. No, just that's absolutely true. It's not just education, right? It's like any government office, right? And, and many private ones, too. But yeah. Hi. Um, so d definitely, I, I agree with you that there's a lot of potential in how, how lessons from free software can, can change education, but we kind of take, we've taken it for granted that that's the case. So uh, none of the kids that would be using OpenOffice would be hacking on OpenOffice. Maybe some of them would. But uh, how, how I, I really want to hear the practicalities of how using open source software in class or, or how important um, ideas and, and methodologies from free software development into class changes education because that's something that I haven't heard yet. Well, I could probably take a stab at that. Um, I think if you uh, buy into the notion that the values that go into the software or into the creation of the software percolate through into the features of the software, it's it's not surprising, for example, that um, when you're using MediaWiki, there will be an option to license the, the, crea your cre the creations of your work under Creative Commons license, whereas I think you'd be really surprised to see that as an option in Adobe, for example. So um, there's a lot of different ways in which, I think, the, the processes that uh, go into the creation of the software end up being captured and embodied and end up becoming priorities in, in the features that are expressed to the users. And um, in cases like OpenOffice, for, for example, where Maybe it's uh, you know, trying to replicate existing pieces of software that may not be quite as obvious, though even OpenOffice has a plugin and extension infrastructure that um, allows anybody to create um, additions to it. So uh, beyond which, I think I'd also like to make a strong case for 
potential. So even if people don't exercise their freedom, when they wake up and realize that they could have, uh, there's something maybe transformative, especially if you make that lesson. Yeah, oh, sorry. Uh, it looks like there's some other responses to that. Uh, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I, have, I have a direct response to an, an example. Um, so I, I, I don't think that, uh, I mean, it depends on the sophistication of the people who are being, who, who are, like, you can't expect a kindergartner, for example, to contribute probably to much of any of the free software that they use. Uh, but depending on their, their experience, um, you can also, I think, uh, encourage people to, just to submit bug reports. And this is something where the free software community needs to be better about accepting bug reports from non-technical users. But that's part of the process of the sort of democratic engagement that Hans was talking about in the initial piece. So part, and I, and I don't know how many educators are actually doing this, but part of the education process w when you're in using a software tool is when a kid says, ah, I wish I could, or oh man, it's so stupid that, that that's an opportunity to turn around and say, you can. And the way to do it is to talk to the people who make it. So I think that's a concrete thing if we can get free software developers to not bite those people's heads off, <laughs> and if we can get teachers to encourage students to participate in that way, that encourages that read-write loop. Excellent. Yeah. Can I actually respond to that? I continue on that. Uh, I'm actually, I, I graduated from high school just this year, so like all these things could, could, could <laughs> But the point that, that I always thought, we, had, um, we, we have computer science classes at our, at our school. And the thing I, I hate about these classes, I really, I really dislike computer science classes in general, because we always write every software thing from scratch, the basic thing from scratch. If just for once they put like some random software, you know, free free software application, and they let's just you know say change this so that you know this changes so it does this instead of that, just some little simple thing, I think that would help us a lot more than some of the sh just the basic you know software things that we've done over and over and over. So I think that that's another thing that free software could be used for, even in more technical areas in, like, let's say, high schools even. Yeah, the opportunities for civic engagement within the curriculum are really, <laughs> really abound. Um, you want to pass that along and then go I mean, on. in some ways, I'm just echoing what has been said, but software touches our lives so intimately in such profound ways and questions relating to privacy, privacy, security, transparency, right? Um, are really quite important. And some students really don't know about, for example, the effect of Google on their lives. And I think actually introducing and using free and open source software in the classroom is then a vehicle by which to address these much larger political issues. So it's pedagogical in that way, too. So it's a little bit um, tangential or orthogonal, but I think that's a great way to make those issues much more vibrant and tangible to people's lives, too. Right. Software as a foil, which is... Uh Kind of where the book liberator fits into the panel. <laughs> we'll talk about it a little bit more later. Okay. Uh, hello. Yeah. Um, right. This is uh, just a little anecdote uh, that was in the news in the UK a little while ago and demonstrates the disconnect that's about the size of the Great Rift Valley in Africa between most of the population and free software developers on this subject, because we tend to assume that people have at least heard of the idea. And there was a local uh, author uh, education authority in the UK where they found that children were swapping CDs with Firefox or Ubuntu, I can't I forget which, uh, on them. And the teachers reacted to that by getting the LEA to issue a leaflet saying that um, swapping software was pretty much equivalent to graffitizing the, the, the front of their building. And then various free software developers got in touch with them and were fairly polite. And that went up through the, uh, the hierarchy to the point of the person that had made the decision to publish this leaflet sort of countywide. And she phoned up, she looked up the details for Mozilla and found their head office number or whatever and got in touch with someone from Mozilla and said to them, um, is it really true that you're allowed to do this stuff? <laughs> uh, and they said yes, and she said, "Well, could you stop it? Because it makes the uh, <laughs> <laughs> it makes it really difficult to write this leaflet <laughs> if people start doing like anarchistic things, like giving away software." So that's how wide the gulf is. People just don't realise that it's even an idea that you could give away software. And yeah, thanks so much. Insane. And I'm sure Alicia could speak a tiny bit more of this. Um, it's really important, I think, because a lot of free software developers believe that, you know, oh, 
um, we're, we'd be able to circumvent a lot of these uh, uh, barriers and inhibitions. But it's it's crucial to understand that you know it's 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 the librarians and teachers, for example, who will be most compliant and are in the position to actually be doing the education around how to most effectively and when to use these tools. Were there any particular stories you wanted to to, uh, to share? Well, I think about copyright a lot and librarians also, and how we are often really we. I, I don't think I necessarily belong to this, but uh, a lot of librarians are very, 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 very afraid of getting a cease and desist, which um, I think has a really big chilling effect in what we're then able to do. So I think, um, I just heard Jessamine West, who's a very famous librarian, speak at the HOPE conference uh, a few weeks ago, and um, one of the things that she stressed was um, having techies uh, really, really uh, accentuate the fact that it's free or, or it's, it's legal like, it's okay, it's legal. And to really like talk to those fears when you're, when you're approaching um, implementing something new. Um. Excellent. That's, oh, oh, this one might be closer. <laughs> That's cool. One of the things that came to my mind was that there is a strong relationship to, in particular, what you mentioned and what Andy uh, presented in his talk just before this one. And, and maybe you all could talk with Andy and look at his, his presentation because he explicitly went into the question of how to make the politicians um, more positive towards open software. And in the end, it is probably something like the more you teach people use a certain type of software, the more people are going to use it. There is a famous phrase by a professor in high performance computing who says, I don't know what kind of computer language people will be using 20 years from now. I have no idea how it will be called, but it will be Fortran. <laughs> and that's a great thing. If we could change people in such a way that we can say, we don't know what kind of software people are using 20 years from now, but we know it's open source. And to quote Andy, you should use open source rather than free software because free um, has a nasty ring to it. Um, he has an argument to that, so you should talk to that. <laughs> but it's something that you really should do, and I liked your panel, and I think I'm going into <laughs> your time, but anyway. Oh, no, we are not opening this up right this second. <laughs> uh, I do, <laughs> I, <laughs> I do want to encourage folks... Oh, I got double. Uh, I do want to encourage folks to stick around at 4 o'clock today. Um, Gail Brewer, who is actually a council member at, uh, New York C in, in New York City, uh, will be presenting, and so there's a little bit of government people could make some of these cases. Um, we're, lunch is next. We're running down on time, but yeah, um, although I'm getting different reports from the, the Meisters. Um, we have a couple more questions that I wanted to try to get to. Yeah, um, so one, one of the things that was mentioned earlier, going back to, is, was open office, and that was also mentioned in some of the talks this morning. Um, one of the things that, one of the things I think is worth thinking about in using software in education, and that I think may make open, open office. It gets a lot of press in, for important reasons because it uses the same document formats as, as Word, and that's kind of what we're, everybody's using now. But it's not clear that's a great example of software for use for education because it's so huge. And we, there, then the point made several times, you know, how many people are really going to go hack on open office? And things like open office and, and Firefox, they're very intimidating because they're, they're giant. Um, in the engineering world, uh, the lingua franca of writing papers is not Word and, never, and hasn't been for years. It's, it's lots of and tech, is very, and tech is very different that way. It's a whole different experience when you start writing a bunch of stuff in, in LaTeX because you, it's a macro language. And you discover that you've got a set of macros you use a lot. You might want to pull them out into a separate file. And before you know it, you're doing free software development. And that type of a program is really different is from a user experience than open office and leads more obviously and directly into the educational experience. And I think that's something to look at. There's so much emphasis is put on writing user interfaces that look like Windows, um, where it's a nice, smooth, shiny surface and everything just flows. The problem is, is that if it just flows, how do you get underneath it and change the flow? It, it, they're, to some degree, they're contradictory. Right. Thank you very much. And I think Mallory was, was trying to bring up in a lot of her examples around collaboration ways in which uh, the network infrastructure is, is creating a new um, layer of interactions, for example. So the collaboration work, the annotation work, um, I don't know if people here were expecting us to talk a little bit more about Moodle and Sakai, for example, which are very popular in the educational world, and contrast that with some of the more general purpose uh, content management or uh, uh, collaboration tools. Um, does anybody want to speak maybe to the difference between these monolithic systems and smaller tools that are, that are loosely coupled? Like, do you guys have strong opinions on that? Uh, we lost our mic. Oh, <laughs> I guess we're totally out of time. Uh, lots of questions. Well, we should... 
that was my uh, reply, but yeah. Yeah, I think we need to, and something that um, open source can, can offer is that we can customize more tools for education. I think we need to do it more often. And like younger computer users need different tools and different software, and um, a lot of times they just get the same bland stuff that everyone else gets. And I, that's a bad thing, I think. Uh, and I just practically open source is a great way to do that because you can have people who are closer to the learners developing the software rather than a corporation who, who's much farther away, even if it's a corpor uh, free software corporation who's doing it. So I'll give you your mic back. Cool. So <laughs> one more question, I think. And Ashish. Um, wow. I, uh, this is oh, more of a response. Make your last question. I have two quick things to say. One, uh, for Firefox being an intimidating product to get involved, there's actually a wiki page on Firefox that's a complete walkthrough of how to find, the so get the source, uh, add a feature, which is re changing where tabs appear. It's a really cool walkthrough and teaches you how to hack Firefox and uh, try it. I can give you a link in person. And as to the person who said that high school CS education sucks because they don't teach you to modify things, uh, talk with me afterwards. I want to get some grassroots product going to go to colleges and high schools and teach people that they actually can modify software. Thanks. So I'm from Melbourne. Uh, where I work, there's a lot of people that are excited about the possibilities of iTunes U. Um, it's not really my area. I don't really even know what it does. But I'm wondering if there's some comments from people about, you know, is that a good thing from the free software's perspective? Is it a bad thing? Are there alternatives? Wow. Uh, iTunes U is, uh, is problematic, I think, even before you get to free software. Um, they've, uh, <laughs> it's completely inaccessible. Um, the 508 compliance is, is entirely broken there. Uh, what's really frustrating about this is, for people that don't know, Apple is once again very, very aggressively trying to uh, uh, hook people in the educational world on, on their tools and products. iTunes U is a, is a, is a program uh, university-wide that uh, provides universities with a lot of free storage, actually not that much uh, nowadays, um, and the administrative tools to kind of get their, their multimedia um, up in a way that can be easily distributed to, to mobile devices. Um, and they also do a little bit of authentication integration, which um, um, is, is useful for folks. But um, even though they speak HTTP, uh, you cannot access the content using a standard browser. So um, you can't easily get to it, say, from um, operating systems that don't run iTunes. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's tricky. Uh, there's no screen readers yet that I know of that can, that can read, um, that can process the information inside of iTunes. And so I think it's, it's, it is situations like that, especially in the cloud and software as a service, that are, are beginning to threaten freedom in a lot of the ways that we're describing. Um, do other people have direct experience with iTunes, or that was a pretty specific question? Yeah. I, I, think, I think we should stop because we're running into the lunchtime, and uh, maybe we can continue this discussion. It's over lunchtime, but as far as people would like to stop. I would like to thank you for all your presentation and all your sharp analysis. It doesn't work. Hello? Thanks. Um, Thank you once again, and um, I hope to see all of you back after lunch. Enjoy your lunch. Thank you for your presentation.